Hello, my name's Paul Robinson. I'm the author of three books on thyroid um, treatment. One's called uh, Recover with T3, then there's the CT3M handbook, and my more recent one is the Thyroid Patients Manual. I spent probably the last 10 to 15 years trying to help thyroid patients recover their health after hypothyroidism. Um, I do some work still online, I used to do a lot more, and I still work uh, with patients one-to-one -one in private consults. So that's what I do. I, I, I use my own experience of 30 years of recovering from hypothyroidism um, to help other people recover more quickly than they would do otherwise. Um, I don't tend to get involved with um, thyroid pressure groups um, and lobbying groups for change. There are other people that are better at that than I am. I'm a little bit blunt, maybe too blunt at times. So I keep my focus on the patient side of things and helping people that basically have been abandoned by whatever health system that they've got. So I keep out of the political side of it, shall we say. However, there have been some things recently that have made me pretty annoyed and I'm getting rather tired of slow progress with thyroid treatment in the UK in particular, but also elsewhere in the world. So today I'm going to go a little off piste for me. I probably won't do this very often, but I need to get some things off my chest because I'm very cross about some things. And because it's a bit off piste, I've got some notes on the laptop here, which I'm going to be glancing down at to remind myself to make sure I don't miss anything out that I wanted to say. I mean, normally when I talk about some of the basic endocrinology that I, might, I, I focus on, I know that stuff inside out. I don't need to look at notes. But today I need, I need to look at notes. So apologies if I do that. Okay, put the glasses on and here we go. So, well, I'm gonna start by talking about some of the things that are not good in present day treatment and are not handled very well by endocrinologists and doctors specialising in thyroid problems. Let me start with T4 monotherapy. That's treatment with levothyroxine and synthroid. Um, and basically, it doesn't always work. A large group of endocrinologists and doctors think T4 monotherapy always works. Unfortunately, it does not. It leaves many patients with symptoms. Some of them can be mild in some cases. Some patients get more or less well, but are still struggling. And some patients are left with debilitating symptoms, so much so that they're virtually an invalid as a result of it, like I was on T4 monotherapy. It can make people's lives unbearable. So it doesn't always work. And there are many, many, many good reasons for that, which I've written about in my books and in other blog posts and other videos. Let's go on to TSH. TSH is becoming and has become since the 70s the de facto main thyroid test to determine if someone's on the correct dose of thyroid hormone. And it actually doesn't work very well. It's It's been proved now in research that it's probably the least one of the least useful tools to assess whether the treatment's been properly dosed and whether even the person's on the right treatment. Oh, at the end of all this, in the text that comes along with this video, in both my uh, on my YouTube channel and on the website, I will include lots of research references. So you'll have that as well. The fact, everything I say here will get backed up by what I what I talk about, things like T4 and monotherapy not always working, things like TSH being one of the least useful tools to assess dosing. That's all going to be there. Talk about lab ranges now. Lab ranges themselves are problematic um, as they're based on very wide population ranges, based on a large collection of people. We know now from research that individuals like you, me, have ranges for FT4 and FT3 that are less than half as wide as those population ranges. And we personally, as individuals, need to be in our right spot for FT3 and FT4. 
if we're not in our right spot, if we're just somewhere within this big population range, all bets are off. It doesn't work. Okay, most endocrinologists are not aware of that and certainly not applying it, and certainly doctors as well. And that's, that's independent of the country. FT3 has been shown to be the only lab test that actually tracks symptom improvement under treatment. Yet, it, is, it remains the least tested of all the lab tests and probably the least tracked in terms of you know the endocrinologist or doctor following its progress and trying to get the person at a reasonable level for them on ft3 that's a problem patient symptoms have been shown in researching as well but we all know this anyway have been shown to need to be at the forefront of treatment i.e. they are the most important things for the person that's treating the patient, the endocrinologist or doctor, they're the most important thing for the doctor or endocrinologist to track and to look to try and improve. If labs all get in the rat, in the, somewhere in the population range, or TSH is sort of two, three or whatever, that's not, that's not good enough. That doesn't mean the patient's well. That's why, that's why, that's why lots of patients remain sick with symptoms. The symptoms are the best indication of whether the treatment's working or not. So that's a problem. I've written so much about that as well. There's an awful lot of research now that, you know, that should be being read and digested by endocrinologists and endocrinology researchers and doctors. And if they did, it would cause them pause for thought and they'd think hard about what they were doing, right? That's really, really important. Of another issue is that all the treatment options are not available usually. T4 monotherapy is available, it's offered, but it's not the only treatment. T4, T3 combination is sometimes needed. And, 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 and it needs to be, you know, you need to be able to titrate the level of T3 and the level of T4 for the individual. Natural desiccated thyroid is, is a good treatment as well, although the, although the ratios are fixed. But even that can be massaged by adding some T4 or some T3 in to change the, the balance. T3 monotherapy, in some cases, like me, in some cases needs to be offered. So all the treatments need to be on the table. They are invariably not all on the table. In fact, it's worse than this because in many cases now, certainly in the UK, in many cases there are patients that are quite well on T4, T3 monotherapy or on T3 treatment, T3 monotherapy. And they're having their T3 removed because, well, there is a cost issue, we know that. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, but it's more than that. There's a belief among endocrinologists and doctors that T4 monotherapy is the only treatment that really needs to be offered because the only way you know, it works it's been shown to work they think and um the clinical trials that they've done in the past double blind clinical trials they haven't clearly shown uh, the benefit of t4 t3 combination therapy or so they believe it's also largely cost driven, we know that, we absolutely know that. And there's a big problem with the cost issue. Um, and that's largely because our NHS, our National Health Service, has completely mismanaged the suppliers of T3 in the UK. The T3, pr price of T3 in the UK is completely out of line with the rest of the world. There's nothing intrinsically expensive about T3. It isn't. That's why it costs a fraction of what it does here on the continent. And, um, you know, there are companies on, in, you know, in, L in many countries in the world making profit of selling T3 at a very reasonable price, my thyroid. Um, so that's a mismanagement issue. Okay, so, so there's an awful lot wrong. So, um, and on top of all that, this is probably the thing that's really put me over the edge in the last couple of weeks, is I've started to see things being put in writing by endocrinologists that just made me damn cross, basically. Let me just start 
with the apparent confusion that seems to exist in many endocrinologists' mind, minds about past clinical trials, which is why we, we keep hearing comments like, you know, clin past clinical trials have not proven the benefit of T4, T3 therapy or T4 monotherapy. Let's just look at that. And we know, I know, I know for a fact, there have been many mentions about this in articles. I'm not going to spend that long on this, but basically, past clinical trials have been utterly flawed. They lacked excellent experimental statisticians working on them to design the clinical trials with the endocrinologists, and they lacked clinical statisticians and were great, really good, good quality people that knew enough about thyroid hormones to actually have a good input into those trials. And so the results, the resulting analysis from those past clinical trials have been subject to amalgamation problems. And this is sometimes known as Simpson's paradox. I'm going to explain that. I've mentioned it in my most recent book, The Thyroid Patient's Manual. I mentioned all the research that's in this uh, video blog today in the Thyroid Patient's Manual. And I'm going to go into more detail here. Um, and to start with, I'm going to lift a chart that directly from a piece of research. So sorry, guys, borrowing your chart here. It's a piece of research called Time for a Reassessment of the Treatment of Hypothyroidism. It's by Midgley, Toft, Larish, Dietrich and Herman. And it's a chart that very simply attempts to explain Simpson's paradox paradox or amalgamation problems. So let me just move this, let's go slide this laptop out of the way. And the camera doesn't move because the camera is on a tripod. And if I don't pull it too hard and I don't pull the cable, there's half a chance that I can get this across without messing everything up. Okay, so that's step one. That's good. Step two is I'm going to put the chart here and I'm going to pull the camera down. Well, I'm not going to pull it down, hopefully. I'm going to lower, lower the camera. And let's put that there. That's not working yet. Oops. I'll get there in a minute. Nearly there. Right. Oops. Sorry. This is quite tricky to do. Get the, get the camera and everything all set up then you suddenly want to go mess with it. It's probably not the best thing to do. Okay, so there we are. That's my microphone here. I'll move that out of the way. So this is a chart, uh, and this is thanks to the, the good research that the gentleman I mentioned have done. And what it does, it's an illustration. It's not straight out of research, okay? It's basically saying if you were to do some research where you were trying to understand how variable A adjusts and how that variable A as it adjusts how does it how does it affect outcome B that you're looking for okay and it involves two groups of people group one and group two and if we imagine you can hopefully see the, the red colors there for group two and the blue color for blue group one. So the dots are individual test results on a clinical trial and the lines are basically trying to fit some sort of correlation in this case an inverse correlation between variable a and outcome b. So what you do when you're doing a trial like this you do your test you get your test results per subject and then you do a best fit. And in this case, if we just don't look at the blue line for a moment, we just look at the red line. You can see here that, that you know, there is a correlation. So as variable A down the bottom here is higher, you get lower outcome B. And as variable A gets lower, you get high, higher outcome B. So there's a correlation, you can see it. Same thing for group one. There's the same correlation that it's in a different place, but it's a different group, and 
it's got a slightly different set of needs, but there's a correlation still. Now, if you didn't know which subjects were in group one or group two, red group or blue group, and you try to look at that mess, that mess of dots all became black, for instance. There was no, you couldn't tell if people were in different groups. There would be no obvious correlation there whatsoever. The subjects who were actually in two different groups were amalgamated. And when you look at that, there is, they, those dots are all over the board. They're everywhere. You can't put a best fit line through it. There's no strong correlation. That's called an amalgamation problem. It's sometimes known as Simpson's paradox. And it's very important. It's a statistical, it's a statistical known issue. Okay? And the research paper I've already mentioned, Time for a Reassessment of the Treatment of Hypothyroidism, goes into that, explains it really well. And that is your reason for why all your past cl clinical trials, that's why, the, that's why they haven't concluded there's any correlation between T4, T3 and patient need. I've got an even simpler way of putting this. All right? I'm just trying to think of... Um, a good way of putting this across simply yesterday. I only thought about doing this video blog yesterday, so that's partly why I've got notes, because it's new territory, new topics, essentially, and um, I was trying to think of a different way of putting some of it across. And I have done, I think, well, feedback will bear me out, won't it? We'll find out whether I've done a reasonable job or not. Okay, so... In order to do this, I was trying to think of what game did I play as a kid? What could be useful to try and communicate this idea? And well, some of you are probably thinking, oh, no, Paul, what's he going to come up with? Are you going to come up with chess or risk or something? Or diplomacy even, which I'm not very strong at, as you know. <laughs> um, but other strategic sort of games. But no, actually, one of my other games that I was kind of keen on when I was very young it's called Mousy Mousy. Mousy Mousy. In which you have a, a set of these, one of these little plastic mice each, and you put it down on a little mat. And then someone who's a chaser has to make a move and put a little cup down on top of the mice and try and catch the mice before you can pull your mouse off the mat. I loved it. I thought it was great. Not very strategic, but a lot of fun. I still have the game. So, I want you to come with me into the mouse universe. It's a mouse universe in which all the inhabitants are semi-intelligent mice. There's an awful lot of them. And they have thyroid issues, similar to ours. In fact, strangely enough, the mice scientists have created thyroid treatment medication, which is oh, well, it's remarkable. It's exactly the same as ours. They have T4 monotherapy. They have T4, T3 combinations. They have T3 monotherapy. They have it all. And luckily for the mice, the semi-intelligent mice that ha happen to inhabit the mouse universe, they also have mouseocrinologists semi-intelligent mouse-o-chronologists in the mouse universe. So, I'm going to bring you into the, the, almost the lab of the, the mouse-o-chronologists and show you how it works. So here we go. We'll go into the mouse universe. Right. Almost there. Just about there, I think. Oops. There we go. Okay, put my glasses back on. Right. So, we have various categories of mice with thyroid issues. Um, let's start with the, the least problematic of the thyroid-issued mice. The green mice. 
They're pretty happy and healthy on T4 monotherapy. Lucky them. There's lots of these green mice. Healthy, nice green mice. Right, we have the blue mice. They need mostly T4 monotherapy and a little bit of T3 added in to feel okay, to feel well. There's some of these, not as many as the green mice, but some blue mice. And we have the red mice. They're pretty unwell without having a much higher mixture of T3 to T4 in their treatment. A different ratio of T3 and T4, more than these guys. And then we have the most unlucky mice of all, the guys down here. And there's not many, many of them, there's only very few of them by comparison to the rest. But they're completely non-functional, these guys, without T3 monotherapy. Okay? So that's our mouse universe. And our mouse acrinologists are determined to basically do clinical trials and find out what is going on? Well, how come some of these mice seem to need T3? They're trying to see if it's true. They're trying to see if the, the mice are actually just messing about or have psychological issues or are depressed. In a minute. And we all have heard that before. I've heard it. I've had it directed at me. You're just depressed. Have some antidepressants. Oh, you've got chronic fatigue. You've got ME. There's nothing we can do for you. Your lab tests are normal. You're fine. You're treated. Anything but you still have a thyroid issue because your symptoms are exactly the same as they were to start with. Okay, let's go back to the mouse unit. But sorry, I had to say that. Here we go. Right. Right, here we go. So, mouse chronologists want to do a clinical trial. So what do they do? They get their subjects... Okay, a whole bunch of subjects, and they stick them in their clinical trial. Great. Sounds sensible, doesn't it? They don't use experimental statisticians that are really super good at this. They probably don't even listen to some of the other research that's already pointed out some flaws in doing this. But they do this clinical trial. They do the clinical trial with a whole bunch of subjects, a lot of mice. They haven't categorised the mice, which means they don't know which ones are the green ones, the red ones, the blue ones, or even the black ones. They just know there are a whole bunch of subjects. And they do this test. And they, they test the subjects with T4 monotherapy and with T4, T3 in combination. And it's a double blind trial. So they give some of them one medication. They give some the other one. And even the scientists, the endocrinologists, don't know I should say that the endocrinologist rather than scientist, to be honest, because that's going to get me off on another point if I if I go down that route. But they don't they don't categorise them, okay? Um, they just put them in put them in the trial, do the testing. What kind of results do they get? Do you think they get any sort of correlation here between any of these guys and T four T three combination therapy being needed? Well. No, they've been subject to amalgamation problems and Simpson's paradox. What they get is garbage in and garbage out. Good old computer expression. When they do their analysis, it shows no clear correlation between T4 and T3 use and the health of any of the mice because you can't tell. They're all mixed up. The cohorts of different needs are no longer evident. You can't see it. It's just a jumble, a jumble of dots, like the previous diagram was. It's a mess. Now, if they were smart, what they do is they take, say they take, well, let's leave the black mouse out of it for a minute, because T3 monotherapy is even more problematic for some of these mouse chronologists. If they take these mice, but they categorize them, they know that. The green mice know which ones are the. They know which ones are the green ones. They know that these guys are happy and healthy on T4 monotherapy. They know the blue guys 
basically happy on T4 with a little bit of T3. And though the red guys need a different combination. And then they put them all on the trial. They do double blind trials still. You know, they still don't know who's getting what treatment. But afterwards in the analysis, in the analysis phase, they can use that information of what groups they're in. They can just look at the blue group, the red group, the green group, and see what correlation there is. And what do you think would happen? You get a correlation. You've got to get a cholera, cholera, cor correlation. You've got to get a correlation because we know it works. We know T4, T3 combo, T4, T3 combo works. We know it does for some people. Okay? That's what's needed. It needs proper clinical trials that are properly designed by really good people. Not just endocrinologists that are sticking a whole bunch of people in and do, having some, some stats done. Okay, maybe clever stats, but not good enough. Not good enough to, to avoid Simpson's paradox. That's what needs to happen. Now, the guys that I mentioned earlier in the time for a reassessment of the treatment of hypothyroidism, Midgley, Toft, Larish, Dietrich, and Herman, have a list of about 20 different um, clinical trial improvements listed. It's either in that paper or it's another one. And that's probably one of the two I've listed underneath this. But they've already worked this out. They've got a list of improvements. That's their answer. So I'm actually, I'll put this away now. I'll move, I will go out of the mass universe. Right? That was my simple example. I took rather longer over that than I meant, meant to, perhaps because I was enjoying it too much. I, I'm sick of hearing, honestly, sick of hearing, I'll move the laptop back as well, sick of hearing anybody quote that the, the clinical trials have shown no evidence of there being a need for T4, T3 combination. And you having that statement being used to justify everyone being on T4 monotherapy. It's rubbish. I'm sick of it. It's rubbish. The research is out there already. It proves it. Even to show how it should be done. New clinical trials are needed. And they need to identify different patient groups a priori before the, before the clinical trial's done and then attempt to correlate the results using the information about each group. Okay? It can be done. And that's the problem. I refer to it in, in the thyroid patient's manual. I don't rant about it quite so much, but I, I refer to it and I list the research. Okay, so that's one thing. That's a rather annoying, I, I keep hearing. It's almost a justification for not doing anything that I'm hearing from endocrinologists, endocrinologists and doctors. Here's another, what I call, rather dumb comment that one well-known endocrinology researcher has said recently in print, in an article. He said that things have got more complicated due to T3 prices and aggressive thyroid pressure groups. Well, the T3 prices I've discussed earlier, they are entirely down to the NHS mismanaging their supplier. There's no need for it. There's no intrinsic issue with making lyothyronine. So that's, as far as I'm concerned, a non-issue. Just get the NHS to get a different supplier in. That's what needs to happen. It needs to happen pronto. What can I say about aggressive thyroid pressure groups? This is when I start to get really cross. I, nah, I'm going to try and be polite. What do I think about it? Tough is what I think about it. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm sorry. Thyroid patients have been left suffering with appalling treatment and bad treatment practices for far too long. And if the endocrinology community had done a much better job of clinical research, clinical trials, and they read and digested some of the new research and taken that on board, maybe we wouldn't have the need to have thyroid pressure groups at all. Basically, stop keeping thyroid patients sick. Then the problem with thyroid patients complaining about current treatment would go away. It's at your door, mate. It is. Thyroid pressure groups only try to represent sick thyroid patients who are sick 
with their treatment and sick of the situation. And that's, that's just a stupid, stupid thing about aggressive thyroid pressure groups. That's just nonsense. Um, they should start to see thyroid patients as their customer and start listening to the voice of the thyroid patient. And then maybe, maybe there's some be some positive change. Instead of having their yeah, I was going to swear. Having their wagons in a circle, basically, which is what happens, what's happening at the moment. Okay, my last thoughts in this video are spurred by another piece of terminology that I read in at least two different articles recently. This is a reference to patient dissatisfaction with T4 monotherapy. I am sick of hearing that way of describing it. We're not talking about people who go to a restaurant and complain that to the waiter they've got a bad steak. It's not dissatisfaction. It's in many cases desperately ill people who are not just complaining for the sake of it, their lives are being ruined. In some cases, yeah, I can take a drink, I'm getting emotional. I was trying not to do that. Pepsi's disgusting stuff, I know, but I like it. Okay, calm down. People's lives are being ruined. In some cases, people can't work any longer. They lose their jobs, they have to stop work. Their families are being affected. Relationships are being damaged, yes, that happens too. Um, they are dissatisfied thyroid patients. They are very, very sick in many cases. And they need and deserve to get well quickly. So it's not like there's a small number of people like that. There's an awful lot of thyroid patients like that. And when they're not offered a trial of T4, T3 combination therapy or T3 monotherapy when needed, they're being denied the chance to get well. And worse than that, they're having their teeth, many cases, they're having their T3 that's actually helping them. They're having it removed. I'm sorry, that's... I don't know what to say. I mean, to, to be honest, that it's more, it's a lot more than dissatisfaction. It's in many ways, it's worse now. It's worse now than it was back in the 1960s and earlier when people, did, all they had was natural desiccated thyroid. At least they had T4, T3 combination therapy then. And with the advent of, you know, TS, the TSH test and, and Synthroid, levothyroxine, things have got a lot worse. We're all, we are, I've written about this before, we're actually entering the, or if we're not entering it, we're in it already, the dark ages of thyroid treatment in the UK. It isn't patient dissatisfaction. It's far worse than that. And what's happening, and the denial of proper treatment, and the removal of treatment that's working is tantamount to abuse. It's not a good situation. I'm going to keep doing what I do, working with patients, tr trying to help individuals get well. I probably won't get more deeply involved with thyroid pressure groups because you can see I'm a bit, what's the word, tactless or blunt. Um, it's not really my thing, but from time to time I might get cross and say something else. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to keep on doing what I do and um, let's hope. Fingers crossed. Let's hope we get some much needed progress soon. Because it's a, it's a, just a dreadful, dreadful situation. Okay, so that's, that's it for me. I'm going to say goodbye now and hopefully calm down and do something different the rest of the day. Take care. Bye.